Uh, welcome to Amy June's session. Um, this is Amy June Heinlein. She is the uh, community manager for opensource.com. She is also a prestigious Erin Winborn award winner for DrupalCon. Um, <laughs> she's been around the Drupal community for a number of years um, as a community advocate, developer advocate, just all around amazing person. So very happy to have her um, and give her talk today. So without further ado. Thank, thank you, you, Kelly. So you are at accessibility is a moving target, and I have given this talk before, but because accessibility is a moving target, there's always something new and something that we talk about. Um, like uh, Kelly said, I am Amy June Heinlein. It is titled Camel Case, Never Amy, Never June, Always Amy June, one word all together. I use the pronoun she, her, I am the community ambassador. Um, no. I am the community manager at opensource.com, and I do Volkswagen Chick across all of the medias. And this is Spot. You know, usually I have the slide in there for my virtual presentations because we might see him. But if there's any typos like 2020 instead of 2022, we can blame Spot laying on my keyboard. <laughs> and um, so that's him. And then I have another kitty, Pantera, which we never see. So there's a picture of her. <laughs> what are we going to talk about today? So we'll talk about a little bit of what a, is accessibility because I don't want to make any sort of assumption of your skill level, but I won't go like pounding into the basics, but I do want to give some basics because I want to have an accessible presentation for everybody, of course. So a little bit of terms and definitions. The terms and definitions are United States and Canada centric because that's where we are. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, what's on the horizon, what's coming up next for accessibility guidelines. And then we'll talk about how our digital assets grow and how we manage them over time. So that's when I say the life cycle of a website. And then we'll talk a little bit about designing for accessibility, not only designing, but designing content for accessibility. And then if we have time, I have a list of tools that are really great for doing some testing and helping people out with that. So this is supposed to be a red slide and it's pretty, but um, how do we embrace accessibility? First, of course, we have to understand what it means. So in, this, in the context of this talk, it's going to be about really making sure your content is rich and can be accessed across digital assets. And when we talk about digital assets, it's not just our websites, it's our applications, it's our games, it's our VR, you know, accessibility is for all of those things. And why do we design for accessibility? Well, lots of people will only design for accessibility because they have to, because it's the law, depending on what type of website they have and what kind of funding they have. Um, but Hold on, uh, I have a, my, one of my kids is pinging me and I didn't turn off my text messages, so I need to turn that off because I don't want to see it. He's fine, he's 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, we, will, we really want to include everyone in our audience, you know, um, if you look at it from a monetary point of view, if you run a consumer website, you want to make sure that you include all of your consumers. You know, if you're at a college, you want to make sure you include every single student. Um, and then we have to remember um, that not every disability can be seen. There are tons of invisible or non-visible uh, disabilities, one including debilitating pain. You know, fatigue can be a disability, being distracted, like just now I was distracted with a text message popping up. Um, there's things like cognitive dysfunctions, there's learning differences, there's mental health disorders, along with those things that we commonly think about, the, the hearing and the sight. And um, according to the Center for Disease Control, and this number has been pretty stable over the years, they say that 26% of people living in the United States live with some kind of disability. Uh, that's one in four people. So, you know, look around us, you know, there's quite a few of us in this room that live with this, a disability. And again, we have to think about other things, like as we get older, 
we become more disabled with time. We have, you know, age-related hearing loss. We have age-related visibility. You know, we need glasses, things like that. But there's things like temporary disabilities, like you get LASIK surgery, and a couple of days after that, you have to wear the dark glasses or your, your vision's blurry. Um, the pandemic, so you're at home and there's noisy children. You know, the, your dynamic has changed. You can't hear so much anymore. You're on the bus and you have your phone and you don't have your headphones and there's no captions. And then um, accessibility is a lot about inclusion. So when we talk about inclusion, I want to be sure that everyone remembers that being accessible and being inclusive is not about giving special privileges. Um, and I don't like the word special privileges. We at the high school just talked about this because when we use the word special privileges, it sort of um, diminishes the fact that we're disabled. It makes it like a special privilege and it's a basic human right if we think about it. You know, there's nothing special about being accessible. It's a, it's a human right to have access to information. So again, terms and definitions, just going to breeze through it. And this is a really pretty red slide with lots of stuff. Um, so we might have heard of the ADA. That's the American with Disabilities Act. And this is um, not necessarily towards the web. This is for all around us, you know, our physical locations as well. And really what this does is it prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people who live with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else. And this is American Disabilities Law. Uh, Section 508, um, when we work with websites, we often hear 508 compliant. This requires federal governments to develop, procure, and maintain, and use information, technologies, and communications in a way that's accessible for people who live with disabilities. And this is regardless of whether or not they work with the federal government. This is everybody. Bill 81C is the Accessible Canada Act, and this was brought about so people could have a barrier-free access to Parliament. And then we have the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, and this is an international community that develops a lot of our guidelines around accessibility, which is a good segue into the WCAG guidelines. That stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And up here, you know, I have... The goal is to provide a single shared standard for web content accessibility. And this is for a lot of different people. Well, it's for everybody, but it's primarily intended for our content developers, our authoring tool developers, our evaluation tool developers, and then again, anyone who needs a standard, you know, some sort of baseline to go to to go off of. Accessibility, inclusion, and user experience are not all the same things. They're very different. They can be very similar, but they're all very different. So we have accessibility, inclusion, and user experience. 2.1 guidelines, this is a collection of 40 guidelines um, that they came up with a few years back that improve usability for all different abilities. Um, they're based on the poor principles, which I'm going to go into, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So we can see perceivable. This is um, the user can identify and, and use and access elements by means of their senses. Perceivable means that they can, oh no, I just did perceivable. Um, operable. Operable means that they can use the controls, they can use the buttons, they can turn things on and off from the interface. Understandable means that our consumers can understand and learn and be able to use your website from page to page. Learning from page to page. And then robust, this has to do with being able to use whatever technology you want to access the web. If you can access the web visually, if Make sure that you can access the web uh, with your keyboard, with a screen reader, all those kinds of things. So to break it down, like really simply, um, we make it easy to see so we accommodate visual needs. Uh, the CDC reports about 12 um, million people over 40 live with some sort of vision loss. Um, but remember, you know, there's those situational disabilities like having a cracked cell phone screen or, you know, glare when you're out in the sun. We want to accommodate motor needs, so we want to make sure that it, your uh, assets are easy to interact. This could be something like someone who lives with paraplegia or Parkinson's or has a palsy. 
you know, those touch targets on the phones that are too small, you're making sure that people can access those. And then, you know, auditory needs, you know, make, make it easy to hear. Um, and this doesn't only benefit people who are deaf and hard of hearing, it accommodates those people who are in those noisy environments and need to utilize those captions. And then the last one is, you know, make sure that uh, you address cognitive needs and you make it easy to understand. Um, this can be people who live um, with uh, Down syndrome, you know, they have a, a different way of processing information, but this can also include people that have a difficult time focusing. So those are the poor principles. 2.1, um, 2.1 is this, the standard right now in time. This is where your websites need to reach right now in time. And it's everything that 2.0 had plus 17 new things. I'm not gonna go into the 17 new things because this is a invitation for y'all to figure out how to find your own resources. Um, but it goes into line height, orientation, a lot of design aspects of the site. And then WCAG, or WCAG, is broken down into three levels, the A, the double A, and the triple A. And each A is an increasing level of compliance. So if you're at level A, this means minimal compliance, the minimal amount of work you have to do to make it accessible. Um, if you're only at this level, it means a lot of people can't access your website. Double A, 2.1 double A is the standard compliance that a lot of things, a lot of companies aim for. Um, and it, it's acceptable compliance. That's the one that's generally accepted right now. Um, and that means that your website and your assets are usable by most people, the majority of the people. But then we have that AAA level. And what this is, is this that optimal compliance. Um, it really indicates the highest level of usability the more accessible your website is, the more usable it is for everybody else. So what's next? Oh, that's funny. Like the black slide shows up with the little pattern, but my red one didn't. That's okay though. Okay, so 2.2 is what's coming up next. And, it, and really, this is what we should be aiming for now. If we are building a website or a digital product right now, we should be aiming towards these new standards. There's no reason to do 2.1. The caveat being that some of these guidelines aren't set in stone yet, so you might have some stuff that is more accessible than what's required, but I don't see that as a problem, you know? Um, but 2.2 was really, the goal was to improve the 2.1, of course, but it improves the guidelines for more user groups that they didn't think about so much in the past. Um, more guidelines around low vision, more guidelines around um, cognitive and learning disabilities, um, and more guidelines of uh, our extended technology like virtual reality and our mobile phones, because a lot of these older standards didn't talk about these things. And it's got about nine new items right now in draft form. Um, again, not gonna go into them because it's our responsibility as web designers and product owners and developers to figure out a way that, to keep us informed because they're always changing. There's always new technology coming out. And again, you know, um, the working group recommends that everyone adopts that 2.2 because it is coming up on the horizon. And there's a 3.0 on the horizon. Um, this draft keeps getting pushed a little bit because it, it, um, it works a lot with uh, user needs and compliance testing, and there's a lot of conversations around this because it's kind of a new dynamic. Um, it's not replacing 2.2, it's sort of an auxiliary augment of, of, the, of the guidelines. And it really, really changes things up because they're taking into account, you know, those more, more of those disabilities, more of those cognitive disabilities. Um, and we want to be able to apply more technologies and we want to be able to, um, as the guidelines increase, we want to open up space for those augment, like I can't stress enough all of these emerging technologies. I don't even know all of them. You know, my kids come home every week with something new and I'm like, wow, okay, that's another thing that we have to think about and design for.
So accessibility is never static. You know, um, not only are the guidelines changing, but what we put in our websites and the content is always changing. So you could have an accessible website when you built it, but you hand it off to your copy editors or your content or your marketing team and they build landing pages and you give them WYSIWYGs. Well, guess what? Your website might not be accessible anymore. So that's why I say your website is always dynamic and not um, static. I have a couple of resources up here that are sort of those first lines of information from W3C. They have a blog, they have a Twitter feed, they have all kinds of resources and pages. If there's one thing that you follow, we, I don't know how you do your professional development, but I have my professional development articles in a folder and once a week I go through there and I have this in my weekly reads. There's all sorts of, whatever you find, just make sure you have that in your toolkit. You know what I mean? It, User agents, this is a little bit about definition. So user agent is assistive technology, different ways that people use the web. It's any device or software uh, that helps people work around some of the challenges they might have accessing information. We have screen readers, you know, um, they're used to listen to the content of the web page. Oftentimes they convert the text of your web page into speech. Um, but we should keep in mind that not only blind users use screen readers, but people with uh, Cognitive ch challenges may need it to help um, help them with the visuals on the web page. We have screen magnification software, much to its name, it magnifies our content. I use Command Plus Plus. I'm on a Mac. Um, A lot of people with partial sight impairment will use uh, screen man magnification software. Um, I'm going to talk about in a couple slides down, like um, mixing and matching technologies because sometimes we don't always use one. But I always use screen magnification software and I have to be careful because I also use captioning because I'm really hard of hearing. So the way I use those two tools together is hardly accessible. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at your product too. You don't want my, in my case to be an edge case because I'm a person and you know me and now like I'm trying to like build empathy. So make sure that all of these tools that you use, you use in a combination of ways that um, everyone can use your products. And then there's alternative input devices. Um, there's head pointers, motion tracking, eye tracking, uh, speech to input software. This is any alternative to your typical mouse and keyboard interaction. And lots of folks with physical or cognitive impairments will use uh, different forms of uh, alternative input devices. Uh, this is a, a braille, a, a braille machine for, for writing braille. Um, it does, does it both ways. They can write the braille and then as the text comes into the machine, it dynamically changes the, the, the points on the thing so it, it, it'll read in time with, with, your, with your content. Virtual reality, you know, it, this has new chances to include lots of people with disabilities because think of like all the things a lot of folks can't do because of, of whatever they have going on. Virtual reality gives them a gateway to things that they might not be able to do, but when we don't make them accessible, they're missing out on the experience by two, right? You know, they know that they have this thing that they could see it, but now they can't see it. Um, it also adds accessibility problems that it helps with accessibility problems when we think of gaming because a lot of these virtual reality programs are based on the same kind of tools that we use when we develop games. So a lot of this is, is crossed over. And then there's more assisted uh, technology devices. Um, we saw that refreshable braille display. Um, there's the eye tracking. It's a system um, that looks at eye movements, you know, and they can, with blinks and eye movements to track your mouse. Uh, there's accelerators. This helps reduce the effort to type and click. We'd use sticky keys, keyboard customization, you know, if you have limited mobility, the, the tools to um, enter your content, you manipulate your software, you map your keys, that kind of thing. Uh, Pop-up and animation blockers. Uh, If you don't need them, don't use them. They're really hard for people who use assistive technology to get around. They're right there, they're not programmed right, they don't use a mouse, they can't get to the X, they have to keyboard all the way up and down your page to get to the X to, you know, so 
just really think about using a pop-up or not using a pop-up. But they do have mechanisms and tools, you know, like Adblock Plus, you know, that kind of thing. So we have these tools that can um, block these pop-ups. And then we have reading assistants, you know, reading assistants uh, customize font sizes, they do spacing, uh, they scan the text for complex words and maybe do tool tips for thesauruses and dictionaries. Page maps, uh, these are, they display the entire contents of a web page and indicate where you are on the web page. So in case you, you're distracted and you look away, you can come back and see where you are on the page. So this is a little story I told you about like using multiple assistive technology together. And if I'm a, I'm, I was a QA tester for, accessibility tester for lots of years and I would have all of the tools and play around with all of the different combinations and it's really challenging. So these are just a couple of them. And these are real stories. Um, I can never find my USB mouse or my kids have it or the kid a babysat has it in her backpack, you know, two doors down or I forgot it's Bluetooth and I didn't plug in the thing. All sorts of reasons I can never find my mouse. And so I really use my keyboard a lot. I don't rely on my mouse hardly anymore at all. Um, Grateful Dead tickets went on sale um, at a super small venue. You know, it was like 250 seats. And so I have to like wait in line. I'm waiting in line on, on my machine to get these Grateful Dead tickets. Um, kind of camping out and hitting refresh a lot. You know, it's not as bad as like camping out on, on the sidewalk in San Francisco, but you still got to do that kind of camp out. Um, so there's this insanely long mega menu once the page pops up that I can buy my tickets and I only have a keyboard and they don't have like a skip to content link. So here I am, there's this timer going off. I'm trying to get these tickets because I want, I want the best tickets I can, right? But I have to tab through every single one of these mega menu items to get to where I want to go. So I didn't get those tickets. I got tickets on the lawn and they were not great. But anyway, so that's the, just the simple combination of, you know, uh, using a website with a timer with a keyboard. I'm on my cell phone. I'm on the train. There's no seats. You know, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. I have to stand. I'm using the handrail because I don't want to sit down on the BART. Um, so I'm using my cell phone. So I really need websites to be responsive. I can't navigate desktop websites on my cell phone. But I also need it to not limit the the orientation because it needs to go shift from landscape to portrait mode. And then also, I only want one scroll bar because I'm one-handed. So the content I want is right here, but how do I get to it? Because the scroll bar is here and there's a scroll bar here and I only have one finger. So we really want to design our, 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 our websites and assets to be mobile friendly as well. Our devices are getting smaller. We have kids on iPads, things like that. Um, again, I'm on the train. It's standing room only. Um, I want to watch one of my favorite shows, but I can't reach my headphones in my backpack. And there's no captions, so I have no idea what's going on in the screen because it's Doctor Who and, you know, you just don't know. Um, and this one's kind of a little random one is uh, I've dropped my phone because it's wet outside at San Francisco. I've had too much coffee, so I'm probably shaking. I'm trying to get off the train. Um, and I want to turn off the YouTube player because I don't want to waste my batteries, but I've cracked my screen and that X is so small I can't get my finger to close the YouTube app. So just all of these different ways that people use technology are things that we have to think about when we design our layouts, when we design our code, when we design our JavaScript, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, I might have CSS disabled in my browser because I live rural and it takes forever for a picture to come up. Um, you know, I just want to encourage people to, to think about all of, like, these are all things that probably every one of us do with or without a disability, you know, but imagine if you have the added layer of complex, complex, complexity of like a palsy or something like that. So our life cycle of a website, this is a beautiful red slide with images. Um, <laughs> so what's the typical life? Oh, no. Okay. Well, 
These icons are mostly like icons and they're decorative, so I'm not going to explain each one of them for the sake of brevity, but I, it's labeled, so I don't think we need to describe the images, okay? Um, so the typical life cycle of our websites, you know, we draw up the wireframes, we do research, we do some user testing, we get stakeholder uh, input, and then the research gets passed on to our user experience team and the design team. The developers then get involved, and then when our developers get involved, we have the QA people getting involved, and to do QA, you have to have content in there, so our content creators are in there. Um, then it gets kind of popped out, and the stakeholders are looking at it, and then we have content creation, and we have editing, and then it's out on the web, and that's our typical life cycle of a build. Um, and before I talk about a better idea of a website build in the life cycle, I want to talk about roles and responsibilities because it's everyone's job everywhere to be good and kind people, and that includes accessibility. Um, so when we think about our teams, we really want to make sure that we give every role responsibilities. The role of being inclusive and accessible isn't just one person's job. It's not just the QA tester's job. It's not. I attended a session at AxCon a couple years ago, and she, uh, the woman talked about how she works for DeQ, which does a lot of accessibility testing in the design, the Axe tools, and things like that. And they did this product survey, and they found that most of the issues at the web, that they find on websites could have been solved at the design phase. And if we remember from back here, you know, design's here. So if we design, or if we build our websites and think about accessibility at the design phase, then we don't have all of these issues going down the line. So that conversation needs to start at the wireframe level. And for it to start at the wireframe level, we need to make sure that the folks who are designing and building and doing our user research know, have, have the tools to be successful for accessibility. So if we're training our developers for accessibility, we need to do that across the team. Because again, you know, the job doesn't just lay on the developer once, you know, it goes to the QA and they say, oh, it's not accessible, it goes back to the developer, and now it's the developer's problem. Again, if we had designed in a way from the beginning and everyone knows what their role is and how their role can help with accessibility, it just makes for that more, um, just an easier to manage website over time. So, again, the icons don't matter, you know. Um, this is that linear life cycle of a build, but um, if we inject testing first, we catch a lot of problems that don't go down the line. You know, um, we get some content in there, but we test at every level, then we won't have such this massive like churn at the end of our build. You know, it's like, oh, that squeaky accessibility person at the end says we can't launch on time because X, Y, and Z. So you know what happens? It gets launched and then it never gets fixed. So if we, you know, do these testing along the way and everyone has these tools and everyone has this basic knowledge of accessibility, we don't have that at the end and we're not shipping inaccessible products. But I want to think about a different kind of path, like instead of that linear path, the cyclical path of a website. You know, remember we said it's always changing. If it's always changing, there's never a stop sign at the end. Um, so it's called, it's like a form of um, continuous uh, website improvement, continuous in integration of all of these things. Um, so we want to make sure that we strategize and develop in a way that allows flexible changes as guidelines change. And that's a really important one, so I'm going to say it again. You want to develop in a way that allows flexible changes as guidelines change. We want to develop in a style that isn't so concrete. You know, if it's broken at level one, it's really going to be hard to fix down here. So we develop in a way that it makes it just the easiest overall. We want to make sure that our solutions have impact, that we create 
and implement best practices, um, and we do it iteratively. You know, if we have uh, sprints and regression testing and all this kind of stuff, we do it continually. We do it all of the time. Learning and, and iterating. Um, you know, talking with the team about like, okay, well, I designed this thing, but it's not accessible. How do I get it to work? You have a conversation that's a wider team, not just your one, one website team. And we all learn from each other. We have these retrospectives. So the next time it comes up, someone knows the solution, or maybe it won't come up the next time. Um, I like to equate it to, um, I like Volkswagens. Um, uh, I have a 36 horsepower Volkswagen bug, and I don't know if you all know what that means, but it means it doesn't go very fast, and it takes a lot to get it going, right? But once I get it going, and I get up that hill, it builds momentum. And I like to think of this accessibility, you know, continuous learning, cyclical thing, at, like that Volkswagen, you know, just once you get it going, it just sort of, it snowballs, and you get more information, and it becomes bigger, and it's just this great thing. So designing for accessibility. Um, Probably half of you have already heard this. This is my grand opinion. Um, I am not a front-end designer because my perfectly themed website is Craigslist. Craigslist is the most accessible website and I love using Craigslist. But not all of us um, use you know, have that. We want pretty, we want pictures, we want colors and stuff like that. So designing for readability is really important. And we need to do this at the website level and not the WYSIWYG level, not the editor level. We need to like, make sure that we have style guides that people know how to use and don't let them pick you know, black font with, with a gray background, you know, things like that. So if we design these WYSIWYGs, we make sure that we tool it in a way that people are responsible. We educate them. But you know, we make sure we use visual and semantic space. You know, space is important in that visual design, so um, it's really hard when you have a big block of text that doesn't have a lot of space. We're distracted, we don't read a lot, we look away and we come back. Having stuff separated really helps out with our, um, with our workflow. Um, we want to make sure we use clean typography. Uh, we want to avoid changing typefaces from page to page within our website. And this might mean not having the ability to change that font in the WYSIWYG either. You know, um, We don't want to use all capital letters. When we use all capital letters, some people are, can no longer recognize a word because it no longer has a shape. It's just a rectangle. And I know this because I have rely on captions a lot. And sometimes the captions are all capital letters. And it, takes me more cognitive effort to read capital letters than if it was in a way that familiar, you know, word formation. We don't want to underline text. This goes back to underline your fucking links. Like, don't underline anything else and underline your links. You know, that is like, everyone knows when they're looking at a page that if that is underlined, it's a link. But then some people underline something and it's not a link and it's just like, anyway. That's a whole talk on itself. Um, we want to make sure we use aligned text because it's easier to read. Um, we don't want to use the center justified, the center, the, the center justified, I don't know. We don't want to use the center text, but this left aligned text was really for our reading bracket, you know, but if you're designing websites for, for people that read on the other side, you want to have that right aligned text. Uh, we no longer put two spaces after a period that's left over from our typefacing days. How about colons? Um, I, I... Repeat question for the recording? What about colons? I love colons. I know. One or two spaces. Oh, oh, one space. Sorry. I thought you meant using them um, because there's some accessibility <laughs> issues around using a colon and how to format your list. Um, one space after a colon. But that's really left over from that typefacing days where, you know, typewriting. So no just one space after the period. And then you want to make sure that you support resizing because as I like plus, 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 you want to make sure that like it's not all jumbled and half your word is down at the bottom and then like all of a sudden it's in an accordion and you know, just make sure that the rule is I think up to 200% is sort of the guideline and then after that, you know, it's up to you, but 200% is that goal of making sure that it'll, it gets resized. And a little bit about accessible content. I know I'm coming up on time. Um, again, your code's accessible. Um, 
but what happens when we get in there and we add content? Um, I've been on some teams where there's a new content creator every week, or you're in a big marketing team and someone's editing stuff and no one follows the style guide, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we have these WYSIWYGs and we have all the bells and whistles and there's things in there that people don't know how to use and they're changing font colors and they're changing font sizes and they're inserting pictures and all of these kinds of things. So be really mindful about if you have a WYSIWYG, educating, using tool tips, maybe just have markdown, you know, teach your content creators markdown, you know, that kind of thing. But again, it's just about responsibility, right? You know, if you're going to have that kind of thing in your website, make sure that people know how to use it. So know your audience. Um, make sure that your language fits your audience. I mean, yes, we do build pages for everybody, but we do build pages for specific audiences as well, you know, so stick to predetermined reading levels, um, put information in logical order um, with important details first because people don't read anymore. You know, so put your, if you have a call to action, you know, or, or, um, or something really important, put that at the top of your page or maybe divide it up into headings because remember, we're doing this. For, the, for Kevin's recording, um, I'm scrolling my hand uh, like I'm going on a, on a cell phone. Alternative text, um, this describes images for people who are unable to see them. So whether it be that your, your browser is slow or you know, um, you're low vision um, or like my images that weren't showing up because of the contrast of the screen. Um, You want to make sure that your alternative text is meaningful. So if, if you have an image up there to evoke emotion or impact, your alt text should, should relay that information to. Yeah, it, there's a red barn and there's like all of these hills, but the story is about something else, but it's just an image. Then you would just say something like, you know, the red barn on the hill on a field. But if there's something specific in that image that evokes emotion, it's unfair to the people who can't access it visually to not include that. And I know there's all kinds of rules about length and things like that, but it's more about like the information you want to convey, the emotions that you want to want your consumers to process. Familiar language is an important one, um, especially when we write content for everyone. We really don't want to use jargon and buzzwords. People don't always know what it is. Um, we want to, um, well, jargon and buzzwords are really uh, vague sometimes and don't really, dis they're for SEO sometimes, you know, and they don't really have a lot of meaning. Um, be careful when you use rare symbols and characters because not everyone knows what they are. I'm a Luddite by heart and so for me when people like use all of the characters to write something I don't always know what that means acronyms I hardly ever know what they mean and I have to do a search for them so be very mindful that not everyone knows all of these all of the t terms and, um, and all the stuff around whatever product you're selling and then think of search engine optimization too. use words in your in your in your text that people are going to be searching for. You know, are they going to be searching for that big bubbly 22 letter word? No, they're going to be, you know what I mean? So um, things to think about. Plain language, um, that goes back to that bubbly 22 letter word. You know, um, language that's difficult to read just can be a barrier to some folks. They're not going to, they're going to go through that first paragraph and they're just going to abort the the content because it's too complicated to read. Um, of course, again, there's like white papers and medical things where you use those words, but those, you know, those are more targeted audiences. Um, but people who have disabilities um, that affect the ability to access and read uh, content are really held back by complexity of language. And then also, as we're in this pandemic, we're more of a global audience and we think about people whose English isn't their first language and when we have those big, long, showy words, some of your folks who English, you know, is a privilege might not understand. Sentence and paragraph length, um, we want to keep those short and to the point. Um, uh, depending on who your audience is, you know, have a style guide that defines how long your sentences and paragraphs should be. And then I have the testing tools, and I'm just going to breeze through these because I am at time. 
Um, screen readers, uh, it's an essential piece of software for people who um, are blind or visually impaired. I am an advocate of native user testing. Even though I did QA for years and accessibility testing, I refused to do screen reader testing because I'm not blind and I don't use a screen reader natively, so I don't know how they use it. You know what I mean? Like, I have no idea how they use that software. So for me to use, do a screen reader test is pointless. I don't know. I got in trouble a couple of times for that, but I'm adamant about that. And there's a lot of blind and low vision people who are trained to do it, so why not pay folks who that's... That, that's what they can do. But there is screen reader testing, and if you want like a basic baseline of like how your page flows, you can do like Mac VoiceOver or NVDA, I think is the free one. Wave is a non-open source tool that it's a browser extension that has one-click functionality. Um, it's a suite of evaluation tools. You turn it on and then it, it gives you like a user interface of where your errors are. But as I'm talking about these automated tools, they are only as good as what they're programmed for. So they really only catch 30 to 40 percent of the errors. So it's a good base to start with, but they don't catch everything. So these manual, these automated tools are fine, but make sure that you include the, the manual testing as well. AXE is, a, is in your inspector window. It's the accessibility engine. Um, I think it's a JavaScript library by DeQ, and it's available on GitHub. You go on GitHub and you download it, and then it's in your, it might even, is it in the browser now for free? Anybody know? I think you still have to go to GitHub and download it, and then it's in your browser. I mean, yeah, in your browser, in the developer tools. Lighthouse, um, this is another uh, tool. It is open source, and it's an automated tool for improving the quality of your web pages. You might hear people talk about like their Lighthouse speed, but they also have Lighthouse uh, accessibility too. Keyboard, all all functionality needs to go through your keyboard. You know, think of me buying my Grateful Dead tickets. You know what I mean? Um, anything I can't get to on the keyboard, I can't get to. If there's a button or a link that I can't get to, I can't get to it. So all functionality needs to go through your keyboard, and it's really easy to test. You push, you push tab on your keyboard and you have your sticky keys and your arrows. So keyboard testing is a great way. It also kind of helps with the flow of the page. You can do a little bit of like broader testing with the keyboard because sometimes when people design their page maps and things like that, they'll use those, the, the order of, the, of the, uh, what appears on the keyboard. Web aim, um, contracts checker, this is an open source tool. Um, it, so, well, it's a free website, but, the, but the, the tool itself is open source too. It determines the accuracy and clarity of the text and color contrast of your elements. Um, it's got a little, but, uh, little text field here. You type in um, your four color and you type in your background color and there's a few different uh, guidelines depending on the size and the font and the, 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 the strength of your text, but you just type it in and it'll tell you like magic, um, there's tools where you can do eyedropper tools. You can open up, you know, your editor and, or your or your inspector tool and get the get the the hex codes. But um, that's a great color uh, way to test your color contrast. Site improve accessibility checker. This is a pay to play service, but they do have a free extension for. I know Chrome. I don't know about the other ones. And this is my absolute favorite one. It does the automated testing, and it goes through and it tells me the errors, but it also tells me what I should be manually testing for. They'll be like, hey, there's 32 images on here. Do they have meaningful alt text? Oh, hey, we noticed this, you know. It, I think that's fantastic because, it, and it's, especially if you're just learning accessibility testing, you've got the errors and then you've, kind of learn the process of the manual testing as well. The Ally Project Checklist, this is open source. Um, it uh, is a shared standard and it basically is a checklist as you're designing your website, you go through and you check the boxes and um, like you would like a to-do list. Zoom 200%, we talked about this. Uh, make sure that your CSS and HTML validates. This is an, a really important part of accessibility. Um, an accessible page is free of syntax um, problems. 
the readability test tool by WebFX. This is a readability tool that gives you sort of uh, what grade levels, and it has a couple of different formulas depending on what formula your, your site is designed for. It will give you a score and tell you how readable it is, so you can kind of bump up and go down. And then I have a list of resources. Um, these are some tools I didn't mention. Um, some of them are more pay to play than others, but lots of people like them. And I feel like I need to put them on there because someone mentioned them. These are links. So what I'll do is I'll share the slide deck um, on the camp website so you can um, go to the links. And then I have um, some links to some new articles about new guidelines and why guidelines are going through the processes that they're going to. Because again, like I said, it's more about having the resources for a future. It's not about me telling you about them. It's about you having the tools to be successful as they change over time. Any questions? I have like one minute. Sure. You mentioned that um when you were talking about alt text, you said like the red barn. I've heard conflicting things about alt text with, I guess, descriptive elements like that, like colors, mm -hmm. or I guess like if you're describing somebody's hair color, mm -hmm. that isn't truly accessible, but I've heard conflicting things about it. Well, it's about what information, oh. he asked about alt text and how specific and non-specific it needs to be. So. It really comes down to what information you think is important on the page. If it's not important that it's read, then don't put it. But if it's important because it's like an album cover and it's important to the text, then include it. You know, Same thing with like physical attributes of people. That's conflicting too. A lot of, you'll hear a lot of people be like, well, I want people to know that I'm a woman in front of a podium with blonde hair, or other people are like the presenter. You know, So it really kind of depends on the context and what you're what you're trying to convey. Why it's a hard one. There? Yeah, exactly. Why is the picture there? Yeah, I guess my, my thing was just that I've heard, that's, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> With the, like, I guess the descriptive colors, because there's some people that can't see color, mm -hmm. that there's been some talk about like whether that is even <laughs> like it's truly accessible information. So if you put red, mm -hmm. like some people don't know what red is, mm -hmm. so it may not be useful. So I guess that was my thing, because I've heard conflicting. Yeah, it's, it, sure it's, it's, going, it's challenging, you know, like, every, like I say, don't underline anything except the link, you know what I mean? Like, it, it is challenging, and there's no right or wrong answer for that, really. It's about, like, really c conveying your information, yeah. So, I need to, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, first of all, I went to Craigslist and used WAVE, and I got 132 errors. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, I like the site, too. Uh, my question is, is there any way for me to know, uh, kind of like when you use Google Analytics, you see what browser people are in, what device they're using. Is there a way for me to know how many people are using screen readers? I don't know that information. That's out of my wheelhouse. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of a way that that's tracked. Or any kind of device. Right. I don't. I can't think of a way that that's tracked. Okay. Not that it isn't, but I can't think of a way. Why don't I show up in a user agent? Yeah. What you said was, yeah, if, if, if it's a browser, a dedicated pool, it will publish the user agent to the analytics. But yeah, if it's, if it's an extension on a program, it probably won't come through in, in, in a material way. One, one exception to that that you might want to look at is for people using um, browser-aided translation tools. A lot of times you can pick that up in your analytics um, because it will recapture the rewritten DOM. So if you, like let's say, I, I don't know a lot of foreign languages, so still might be helpful, but like let's say home was appearing as CASA and that was being picked up. Um, that's something that you can, at, at least for, um, language barrier types of things, start to get some analytics data on. Okay. I didn't hear it, so that's okay. I don't need to, but <laughs> I can't add to it. <laughs> oh, I can ask you that. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
I'm going to stop.